Okay, uh, so let's get started, I think. This is a fascinating story that still goes on, as you will see with the Moise Prime paper and the revisiting Rohammer paper, actually. Uh, so basically, uh, Rohammer is a reliability or robustness problem in general. Uh, and uh, reliability uh, can affect security, safety, uh, privacy, all of those things in the end. And I like using this example. If you've taken the DCA, you've seen this example. This is a bridge. Well, are, people in the, are people in the back okay with that? Okay, that's a bit too bright for me, but maybe I'm too close. Uh, basically, this is a bridge uh, that is supposed to be robust and resilient, right? We rely on that. That's the word reliability. It comes from relying on something, right? We rely on this bridge being robust, but if you get a bit flip on this bridge, things like this may happen. And this is a real bridge uh, that collapsed uh, in 1940. It's uh, in the Washington state of the United States. Uh, it's very close to where I used to live, actually, about two hours. And uh, I did not cross this bridge because it doesn't exist anymore. It did this for, I don't know, six months or so, and then it collapsed. Uh, and the new version of the bridge has two bridges in place. So it's a double bridge. That's a good reliability principle also, dual modular redundancy, right? If one fails, hopefully the other one won't fail. Unless they have a common mode there, meaning you manufactured it in the same way such that they will fail in the same way. That's called the common mode there in dependable systems. And in general, it's very good to avoid components that have common mode error. At least don't use them for the same purpose at the same time. Right? Okay, but that's the story of the Galloping Guardian. I think of Rohammer as bit flips happening in critical infrastructure like this. Another example, these, these people are constructing a city and they're sitting on a rod that's supposed to be robust, but if you get a, if they get a bit flip, they will not be very happy soon after. Yes. Uh, the new bridges, I don't know. I didn't examine them. They look very similar, but again, common models are a different thing. <laughs> yeah. You can look it up. That's your assignment now. <laughs> okay. But uh, okay. Uh, so we're in general going to talk about robustness, but uh, you can think of this, uh, this as security also. These are clearly different concepts, right? Uh, reliability, safety, security. Uh, but uh, reliability issues can affect all of them in the end. And I think of security as preventing unforeseen consequences and going into the future, this is something, this is a mindset that's important to keep in my opinion, because we'll be building systems, computing systems that are we gonna use in all, of, all aspects of our lives, like currently, People are all gung ho about this chat GPT-4 uh, as if it's the most interesting thing in the world. I'm not convinced of that, frankly, <laughs> but I see that there are a lot of security problems that it can open up, safety problems, reliability problems, and certainly misinformation problems that it can open up. So uh, I think we'll need to have a good mindset of designing computing systems going into the future uh, uh, because we're, we're going to rely on that much more so. So this is an example. I like using these pictures, of course, but you can think of it as a self-driving car. Would you trust your self-driving car to be able to sit on it like this without having, of course, additional controls that this Mr. Bean has <laughs> in his uh, self-driving car from 1990s? Okay. So yeah, basically bit flips uh, will be problems over there. So Rohammer, I think a lot of you have seen it, but if you have not seen it, this is uh, a phenomenon. And this is the phenomenon that enables one to predictably induce bit flips in commodity DRAM chips. Uh, let's see. Uh, and when we first uh, worked on the phenomenon, we found out that more than 80% of the DRAM chips that we tested were vulnerable. Basically, you could induce bit flips predictably. And interestingly, this is the first really documented example of how a simple hardware failure mechanism can create a widespread system security vulnerability. In the end, Rohammer is a hardware failure mechanism. Uh, and it's really a reliability problem, but it manifests itself as a security vulnerability because somebody can take advantage of it to take over the system, get some private data out of it. You will see different types of attacks based. And as a result, people uh, in popular media are writing articles that look like this, forget software, now hackers are exploiting physics. And this is a good high level uh, description of Rohammer in my opinion. But let me give you the story uh, behind it a little bit, because uh, this is uh, something that uh, certainly reliability is something we were interested in in my group for some time. And this is an early paper. What's going on here? We really need to fix this problem because this was 
I think this was an issue uh, earlier. Okay, I'll continue while you're trying to fix this problem. But we actually uh, wrote this paper in 2013, as you can see earlier than the Rohammer paper, uh, where we argued that uh, memory technology scaling is going to be a much bigger problem going into the future because memory is becoming much less reliable. And this is going to create all sorts of problems, performance problems, efficiency problems, uh, as well as reliability, robustness, uh, security problems. When we wrote this paper, we were actually working on Rohammer, but we didn't publish it at that point yet. Uh, so uh, let me talk about this technology scaling problem a little bit. So DRAM, dynamic random access memory, is a memory technology that's used in all of our computers today. I'll wait for him to go quickly. Uh, but DRAM technology uh, is a technology where, where you store charge and capacitor, and you encode the data based on the presence or absence of charge in a capacitor. That's one bit of data, essentially, capacitor. Correctly, the capacitor must work correctly. And the sensing circuitry, access transistor, sense amplifier, and everything that basically enables you to read whether or not there is charge needs to work correctly or reliably, let's say. Uh, and if you were seeing that picture, basically it's a capacitor and an access transistor. And as you reduce the size of the cell, uh, both of these uh, properties become difficult to maintain. Basically it becomes uh, reliably operates uh, the circuitry. Thanks, Akesh. And uh, why do we want to reduce the size of it? So that we can store more data, more bits in a given area. That's the technology scaling base. That's what has enabled us to uh, have systems that have large computational power by reducing the size of the transistors and very large data storage by reducing the size of both the transistors as well as the capacitors. So there's a good reason to actually re keep reducing the size of this. Uh, and But unfortunately, if you keep reducing the size of this, everything here becomes unreliable, less reliable and more vulnerable to noise. And there are a bunch of problems like this. I will discuss uh, some of them. But basically, this uh, uh, scaling, uh, the, the feature size uh, of DRAM was about 35 nanometers in 2013. And today, we're around 10 nanometers. We're very close to 10 nanometers. This feature size basically the, depends on how uh, DRAM manufacturers measure it, but the length of the transistor, let's say. Uh, so uh, we reduced it. It's a measure of uh, how technology scales. But unfortunately, it has become very challenging because of these noise and reliability issues. But we, we want to keep reducing it, basically. So there's a good reason why these things are happening. Uh, so, OK, we've, we've been actually doing some studies. This is a study that we did with Facebook uh, for, a, for a couple of years uh, while we were also doing Rohammer studies. And we published it in this paper, as you can see over there. But basically, we studied all of the memory errors that are present in the, the entire fleet of Facebook. And Facebook is clearly a huge company. And they have multiple data centers world, worldwide, tens of data centers actually worldwide. Uh, we had access to all of the memory error logs that they had uh, in those data centers for many months. And you can see the number of months in the paper. And we basically looked at how do those errors correlate with system failures. And essentially, this is one example graph from, the, from that paper, uh, which shows that chip density that's employed in DRAM in those servers have a strong correlation with the server failure rate we observe in the field. And again, server failure rate is a metric definition. You need to read the paper for exactly how it's done. You need to be very careful with these metrics because if you actually don't have a good metric over there, you may not be able to see, you may actually see unexpected results, let's say. But this is the expected result, basically. If the chip density, the DRAM chip density that's employed in the server is larger, meaning cells are smaller and there are many, many more cells, you get more errors essentially manifested in real applications in the field. So these are affecting real applications. Uh, and this makes sense because with smaller cells, with denser chips, you have smaller cells and more cells. So there's a lot more noise. Okay, so if you're interested, there's a paper. We're not gonna cover it in the seminar. I'm not sure if I remember if we covered it in any seminar, but these are actually interesting studies in general. So of course, with this sort of study, you cannot pinpoint what's going on. There may be different types of error mechanisms. So we actually built a lot of FPGA-based infrastructures. We're still using some of these. Unfortunately, I didn't update the slides with the latest versions, but you'll see some pictures later on. Uh, so this is basically the first infrastructure that we built. Uh, you have an FPGA that can test DRAM chips. And you can actually program the FPGA to do different kinds of tests. For example, don't refresh the memory for 10 seconds and see what happens. Right? You can actually do very interesting tests. Uh, and then we built other infrastructures for the same purpose, uh, for different purposes. And this is the Rohammer infrastructure where we did a lot of studies on. I'm going to talk about that. But this is actually open source. This is a version of it that was open source. 
in 2017. We have a new version that's open source that works for DDR4 chips. But if you're interested in this, there's a lot of research that's going on with this sort of infrastructure. And you can learn a lot about existing memories with this. Uh, I believe we're going to have some papers on a random number generation using memory. Is that correct? Is someone going to describe that? No. In the past, in the seminar, we talked about, for example, how to generate two random numbers using DR. So this infrastructure enabled us to show that you could actually do that. You reduce the latency to access DR, and some cells fail randomly. And the fact that those cells fail randomly can be used as a random number generator. You figure out which cells fail randomly, and that's essentially a random number generation bit. So if you didn't have that, this sort of infrastructure, it's very difficult to do those studies because you cannot change the latency to access memory with if you don't have this sort of infrastructure where you can program the memory control. Yes? How do we know that the cells fail? Yeah, there are, there are tests that you need to do, basically. There are some tests that are defined to pass, let's say, to random. Uh, yeah, it's always a good question, basically. You're as good as your tests over there that are defined. But there are some tests that are defined by NIST, for example, National Institute of Standards and Technology, and other countries have their own standards. Okay, so basically, that's, a, that's, a, uh, that's a, another study that you can do with this sort of infrastructure. And we're going to see some of those studies, I believe, uh, in this uh, course. I think somebody's going to present the PyDM paper. Is there anyone here? No? Maybe they're online and they're raising their hands, but I don't see them. Uh, okay. Okay. So uh, that's the reason we built this infrastructure to understand uh, the issues with the memory. And you can read more about this if you're interested. So actually the real reason why we built this infrastructure was to understand the data retention issues. So DRAM is dynamic random access memory. You need to refresh it so that the data stays, let's say there. Uh, but uh, as you reduce the size of a cell, uh, the data stays less in the cell. So you need to refresh it more frequently uh, as uh, technology scales. And this is a problem with scaling. It affects performance, it affects energy. Clearly right now, for example, my cell phone in my pocket is doing nothing but refreshing memory. It's in self-refresh mode. It's wasting a lot of energy, for example. Uh, if, you, if you did the calculations, if you took DDCA in a, in a data center, for example, with petabytes and petabytes of memory, uh, you're actually wasting kilowatt hours uh, in power uh, uh, to refresh memory, just to refresh memory, just to keep the memory uh, content intact. And what we found out in some of these studies is basically there is a huge heterogeneity in the refresh uh, requirements or retention time of these different DRAM cells that exist in a chip. It looks like this basically. Very small fraction of cells need to be refreshed very frequently, let's say every 64 milliseconds. A very overwhelming uh, uh, majority of the cells don't need to be refreshed uh, at that rate but you can relax the refresh rate to 206 milliseconds for that, for example. So this way, if you really understand what's going on here, you can reduce the refresh, uh, number of refreshes that you do by 75%. And that's a huge gain, clearly, right? You think about saving 75% of the power, and this also improves your performance. And these are old numbers, basically. Today, uh, in some DRM, I think uh, 32 milliseconds is the refresh rate. And I think we're marching towards 16 milliseconds uh, soon. In fact, in, under some conditions, it's 16 milliseconds, right? Every 16 milliseconds, you need to refresh uh, the um, at high temperatures. So at high temperatures, you actually need to refresh a lot more frequently. Okay, but uh, of course, it's not that easy. So it turns out uh, the retention time of a cell is dependent on the location of the cell, which this shows. It's also dependent on the value of the cell and the cells around it, because there's a lot of noise and cross-coupling uh, uh, that happens between the cells. Uh, and uh, that affects uh, the retention time. And it's also dependent on some quantum-like effects, like variable retention time. It's very interesting. We're not gonna talk about it in this lecture, but uh, a cell changes, it's re a cell's retention time changes randomly uh, during operation. We don't know exactly why it changes uh, and when it changes, so it's not predictable, but it changes. So the question is, if it changes, if you test the cell at some point and you figure out that it has a retention time of, let's say, 32 milliseconds, can you trust it? It's not, it's not easy to trust, basically. That's, that's one of the scaling problems because this time dependency, this randomness actually increases as the cell becomes smaller and smaller. And we've shown this in some papers, uh, not this paper, but this paper actually initiated, this is, we wrote this paper that said, oh, you can actually shave a lot of uh, refresh time as well as performance overhead. And then we said, actually, can we do it? So we built this infrastructure and we said that, oh, maybe we cannot do it that easy. That's the paper that's uh, talked about a lot of these. 
And then we wrote a bunch of papers that talk about uh, how can we do it actually? How can we uh, uh, how can we get rid of refresh as much as possible without causing reliability problems? And I'm not going to go over these. So this, for example, deals with the variable retention time problem. Uh, this deals with the data dependency problem. And there are a bunch of papers that deal with a lot of different interesting things and propose a lot of interesting ideas. And you can see more recent to actually have error correction capabilities. And they're also very, very interesting to understand because if you really want to get rid of refreshes, you will need to understand how the error correction that happens inside the chip uh, uh, behaves. Okay, but as I said, these are all works that are enabled by the infrastructure to understand retention time issues. But that was a major reason why we built this infrastructure. If you're interested, you can certainly have, watch more lectures on this. Okay, so uh, while we were actually doing these studies, we were actually quite interested in other issues in memory. And uh, one of the issues is read disturbance, which is what Rohammer is about. Uh, and we also had an infrastructure that's very similar to this that was built for flash memory. And we did a lot of studies on flash memory. I'm going to mention that later on. I don't have it right now, uh, the picture. You will see it's again an FPGA-based infrastructure where you have a flash controller on FPGA and you can change the, uh, reprogram the flash controller so that you can test different things. Uh, and with that, we did a lot of read disturbance testing. And we were quite interested in whether that read disturbance also happens in DRAM. And we worked with Intel on this. And we found out basically that it does happen. And in fact, in uh, predictable, you can, you can actually do this in real DRAM chips out in the field. So that's what draw hammer is. So let's take a look at that. Uh, so basically, if you look at memory, it consists of rows of cells, multiple rows of cells. And in order to access a data value in one row, you can think of one row as, let's say, thousands of uh, cells, thousands of bits uh, stored. In order to access one of those rows, you need to activate that row first, meaning you need to apply high voltage to that word line so that you can read that row and then select whatever you read out of that row. This is called activation in DRAM. Now, if you want to access some other row, you pre-charge that row, meaning you apply low voltage to the word line and there's some other circuitry that kicks in to prepare the array for the next access, essentially. This is called pre-charge. Now, if you keep doing this repeatedly, activate, pre-charge, activate, pre-charge, activate, pre-charge, activate, pre-charge, Normally, nothing should happen, right? uh, But we see that you get bit flips in physically adjacent rows, meaning some cells in physically adjacent rows that are vulnerable to roll hammer flip. They lose their charge. And this clearly should not happen, as we said, right? Because you're not doing anything to those cells. You're not even writing to memory. So you should really not be changing anything in memory. So we call this the hammer draw. We call these the victim rows. And we showed that basically more than 80% of the modules that were manufactured by three major DRAM manufacturers are actually vulnerable to this problem. You can actually induce bit flips in more than 80% of that. I believe we could have induced more if we knew what we knew at this point. So that number might have been closer to 100%. But of course, I cannot verify it. I cannot go back in time and test the same modules at this point. Uh, okay. But we know a lot more right now, basically. This is the first study that shows so, and this is a technology scaling problem because the chips that were manufactured in 2008, as you can see over here, that we tested, were not vulnerable to this effect. So the first appearance that we saw were from 2010, as you can see over here. Uh, and all of the chips that were manufactured between 2012 and 2013 had these bit flips. So why is this a technology scaling problem? Because as cells get smaller, uh, they become more vulnerable to this noise. So what is this noise that we're talking about? Basically, cells are too close to each other. They're not electrically isolated from each other. As a result, when you access one row or one cell, you affect the value in nearby cells because of the electrical interference that happens between the cells and the wires that are used for accessing the cell. The wire is the word line and the cells are on that word line. Right? This is also called cell-to-cell -cell coupling or interference. Uh, and I like this higher level abstraction. There are a lot of low level reasons that are interesting, which we're not going to go into here. I'm gonna mention some papers that talk about some of those low level reasons. But at a higher level, if you apply high voltage or activate a row, an adjacent row gets slightly activated as well because uh, you don't have perfect isolation. As a result, vulnerable cells in that slightly activated row uh, lose a little, bit of a little bit of charge. And if you keep doing this repeatedly, uh, those cells that, are, that keep losing charge, and at some point they lose enough charge that you cannot recover the value that was there anymore. Makes sense, right? Of course, there are actually much more detailed device level reasons that we're not going to talk about here. That's an interesting study also. 
So higher level implications are actually pretty bad because now this, these get exposed to the user directly, right? You have a bit flip in DRAM and that DRAM is visible to the user, visible to the programmer, visible to the system, visible to anyone who can inspect memory in the end. And worse, someone can manipulate programs to actually, or write programs to induce these bit flips. That's what we're going to talk about. And that's what, what's next. So essentially, when we release the paper, we also release this uh, open source code, which is very simple, as you can see. Uh, what this code does is it selects addresses X and Y, such that hopefully they map to the same bank uh, and same subarray, hopefully. And, that, and basically, um, this X and Y uh, uh, are accessed, activated repeatedly, right? So you need to avoid the caches from the CPU, of course, to be able to do that because this, this program is run on the CPU. So we flush X from the cache and we avoid row hits to X by reading this Y in another row. So this is what the program does basically. It activates X and Y uh, in consecutive manner over and over. And if the chip is vulnerable, hopefully you'll get bit flips. Now, this is not the worst case access pattern uh, to enable these errors because X and Y may be far away from each other, but uh, we we also mentioned in the paper that if you actually sandwich only one row between X and Y, you can get many more errors. And later work actually took advantage of this. They call this double-sided hammering. So actually the results uh, that we showed earlier was based on single-sided hammering. But if you do double-sided hammering where we sandwich one row, you get a lot more errors. And some chips uh, could have been potentially vulnerable, uh, even though they may not have looked like vulnerable to us at that point in time. So basically if you run this program on an x86 system, you get errors, as you can see. And this is, these are errors that we reported. This is early paper, later works actually reported very, very similar things in the end. Okay, any questions? Okay, so why is this a security problem? Because, uh, yes. Yeah. That's a good question. I don't know. I don't remember. <laughs> but basically, uh, uh, there, there might be something going on in the memory controller. Uh, and we didn't really reverse engineer it completely. Our goal was just to show that there are errors. But there might be something going on in the memory controller that's not enabling us to activate at a higher rate. Does that make sense? So in order to be able to get the error rate higher, you need to understand how the memory controller behaves also. They may be handling, for example, some of these instructions differently. They may be doing some reordering. So in the end, we don't exactly know the reason, but you get bit flips. <laughs> and in modern other AMD systems, there are bit flips that are reported after us, after this paper were much higher also. Okay, but that's a good question. It's always good to look at anomalies in the data. Yes. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I don't believe you get double, but you get a lot. Yeah, it's not a function, basically. It's not a function of uh, how many rows you're hammering in the end, but you get a lot more. So yeah, if you did double-sided, perhaps AMD would be much higher also, potentially. We don't know because we cannot repeat these experiments right now. We don't have the same system anymore. Okay, so basically this is a security problem because we're breaking memory isolation. Uh, and memory isolation is uh, a very fundamental property, right? Uh, one, an access to one memory address should not have any effect on any other memory addresses, any unintended side effect. Uh, and this is needed for a reliable and secure computing system. And I believe we really need to maintain this going into the future. And we said that actually you can devise a program uh, that can hijack your computer. Basically, we predicted that you could actually do security attacks, but we didn't have time to do that. And these good folks from Project Zero, Google Project Zero, who have discovered a lot of interesting, let's say, vulnerability issues over uh, more than a decade, uh, Figured out that uh, figured out how to do that. Uh, basically, uh, this is directly quoted from uh, their blog post. They have a beautiful black hat presentation. Also, uh, they don't have a paper on it. They have a blog post. Uh, that's the luxury of being an in industry. They can write a blog post and everybody reads it, right? Especially if you're Google and if you're a security vulnerability person. But basically, these, this is quoted from them. They basically learned about the problem from our paper. They basically replicated the problem on their systems. They built two security exploits based on that. Uh, one of them takes over Google native clients, which is not that interesting, but I'm going to get back to that later on. The other one takes over the x86 for Linux. Basically, uh, they induce, they have a nice attack uh, that's probabilistic attack uh, that can induce bit flips on an x86 for Linux system using a user level process. 
And the basic idea is they do a page table spraying. Uh, I'm not going to go over that, but basically they fill the memory with a lot of page tables to increase the possibility of bit flips. And uh, they induce bit flips in page table entries. These are the page table entries that belong to the user level program that's hammering the memory. And they basically hammer memory uh, and they use these bit flips to gain write access to the page table of that program that's hammering the memory. Uh, and now if you have write access to your uh, page table, you can do anything to the system, right? Because you basically can enable yourself to have access to anything in the system. I like explaining this by saying that, for example, if you have a page table entry uh, and uh, if you uh, um, and if you actually want to gain write access to your own page table, you have a page table entry pointing to your own page table and you have a write enable bit in that page table entry. If you flip that write enable bit from zero to one, you get write, write access to your own page table. Right? So that's basically the conceptual view. Of course, this is very difficult to do because it's one bit out of the huge page table entry, right? That's why they have to develop a page spray attack to increase the probability of this attack. So actually that's, it's, it's very interesting how they do the security attack. But again, we don't have time to go over it because there are many, many other security attacks that came after this. So this is called the DMO hammer vulnerability. And uh, I like this, this, uh, uh, this tweet from a famous hacker that says, row hammer is like breaking into an apartment by repeatedly slamming a neighbor's door until the vibrations open the door you were after. Nice to have these analogies. So if you're stuck in this room, don't worry, you keep banging on the wall and hopefully one of the windows will magically open if the row hammer is in effect here. Maybe, I don't know. So uh, there are a lot of security exploits that people have looked at after this. For example, these forks from Kiyu Grass show that they could do these attacks in JavaScript and eventually they can gain unrestricted access to systems of website visitors remotely. Uh, these folks, actually, this is Kaveh Azavi's group. Kaveh is here right now. When he did this work, he was not here. Uh, but uh, they basically showed that uh, you could uh, induce these bit flips deterministically in Android phones by taking advantage of the uh, deterministic memory allocation patterns that happen in the Android operating system. Uh, because basically, you can fool the operating system to allocate a page table entry to a location that you figured out to be vulnerable to row hack because the operating system uh, allocates pages in a way that you can uh, reason about, let's say. And this is a very interesting, actually, they had an app also. Uh, similar folks show that you could actually accelerate these attacks in a GPU because GPU has a lot of accesses that, can, that, uh, that they can sustain to memory. You can actually do this attack across the network using the remote direct memory access interface that is present in modern data centers. Uh, and these, these folks showed the same thing. And these folks actually, they're, they're actually interesting attacks. These, uh, these previous attacks were taking over a system. But then later, okay, maybe you cannot take over a system easily because it's probabilistic. These folks show that even if you cannot take over a system, you can break confidentiality of the system. Uh, you can read some data that you're not supposed to read using these bit flips. And again, details of this are in the paper. And a lot of these papers were actually discussed in past incarnations of the seminar as well. This time we don't have. And then there are these attacks where uh, people show that these raw hammer bit flips can reduce the accuracy of a neural network. There are multiple attacks. I'll show you a couple of them over here. This paper, for example, shows that if you do a row hammer attack on a neural network, the accuracy may be initially good, but the attack leads to a neural network that has pretty bad accuracy because it changes the weights in a neural network in critical ways. So basically it affects essentially all types of applications in the end. And then there are other things that I'm not gonna talk about. This is another attack that you can do on your computer. But I wouldn't recommend that. This could be a solution, but I would also recommend that. Okay, so I'm going to go into a little bit more detail, but if you're interested in uh, detail, we've written a lot of surveys on this as well. This was an invited paper that we wrote that talks about a lot about Rovehammer until 2019. And then more recently, we were invited to write this other paper that talks about more Rovehammer, let's say. Any questions so far? Okay. So, okay, so let's talk about understanding this element. I go into a little bit more detail because since we have this infrastructure, it's really important to understand it because if you understand it, you can figure out how to prevent it also. Or at least you know how you, what you're dealing with. And unfortunately, understanding is, uh, we still need a lot more understanding, let's say. That's what we argue for uh, in this paper, basically. Even though we have gone a long way understanding the problem, we still need to do more to understand it. And of course, we need to solve it some way because this is not sustainable, right? You cannot have memories that you cannot rely on. 
Okay, so let's talk about understanding it. So this paper that we wrote uh, initially about row hammer uh, did a lot of studies to understand it. And thanks to this infrastructure, we were able to do those studies. We tested more than 100 modules, as you can see over here. And there's a lot of results in the paper that I'm not going to go over. In the past, we've covered these pap this paper actually in the seminar also. This year, we're not going to cover it. You're going to see actually a 2020 uh, paper that I will briefly mention that did a lot more studies than this. Uh, so basically, let's take a look at uh, what is the adjacency of the addresser, aggressor rows and the victim rows from the memory controller's perspective. So memory controller issues a row address. If the row address of the aggressor is x, where is the victim? Is it at x plus 1, x, plus, x minus 1, x plus 2, x minus 2? That's the idea. From the memory controller's perspective, that's the really important thing over here. It turns out most of the rows, most of the victim rows are at address x plus 1 or x minus 1, kind of as expected, right? But there are some cases where uh, those rows that are uh, getting bit flips are at x minus 8, for example, right? Or x minus 7 over here, x plus 7. Yeah, they're not adjacent cases in the address space of the memory control. So there are multiple reasons of this. Uh, well, the main reason is basically internally DRAM does some remapping of the addresses. So what the memory controller sees uh, as adjacent addresses logically may not be adjacent addresses physically. Okay. So later works actually did a lot of reverse engineering and you can reverse engineer this mapping uh, of what memory controller sees and the internal physical adjacency of the roles. So you can actually reverse engineer this. There's a lot of work that did reverse engineering. But from the memory controller's perspective, uh, the bit flips happen in non-adjacent rows as well. So you need to take that into account when you're doing so, uh, creating solutions. Okay, let's take a look at the access interval. One solution uh, to the row hammer problem is basically access memory less frequently. And then the question becomes, how, how much less frequently? Right. And this is the curve that you can get uh, if you actually do these studies in the infrastructure. Right? These are the worst chips, worst A, worst B, worst C. These are from three major manufacturers. And uh, less than 55 nanoseconds is not allowed actual, across two activations uh, to the same uh, array. Uh, and if you actually increase that, you, you clearly see a trend in reduced errors. Right? Errors reduce as you reduce the access frequency, activation frequency. And this is expected clearly, right? Because uh, you're doing fewer activations. But unfortunately, you need to increase the, reduce the activation frequency a lot. You need to reduce the access frequency that leads to fewer errors. And you can see that you go up to 500 nanoseconds. So this reduces the performance of memory a lot. So this is not a good solution off the bat. Does that make sense? You don't want to reduce the access rates and access uh, of your memory. But we will see some solution that takes advantage of this observation to throttle uh, accesses to particular rows that are identified to be hammered. You don't want to do this for all the rows that you're accessing because there are some cases where you access some row maybe five times, activate it five times, and then you're done with that row. But in some cases, you're accessing a row maybe 100 times, then maybe some alarm rings and you say, okay, this is not good. So I'm going to reduce the access rate to that row. Okay, refresh interval this is actually important. Basically, 64 millisecond was the uh, standard at that time. Uh, as you increase, uh, reduce the refresh interval, you'll get fewer uh, bit flips. Why? Because you're reducing uh, the amount of time as the cells can, uh, can be activated, a row can be activated. And as a result, uh, you're reducing the probability of a bit flip in the end. Yes. So you hammer a row and then you, that they don't succeed in getting an error and then you take the break or no, mm -hmm. then you grammar the same row again. Is that the same as? That's a great question. <laughs> That's something uh, you should really ask Kao Song because he's working on that. Anyway, not, not right now, but basically uh, hammering access pattern matters. Do you, if you take a break whenever you are accessing a row or activating a row, does it matter? And it does matter, yes. I'm going to mention a work uh, that we did that talks about that briefly, but we have some other work coming up. So if you're interested, talk to Kao Song. And there's a lot of research that can be done in that direction, actually. Okay, very good question. So basically, refresh interval is another thing. How, basically, refresh interval determines how many activations you can do before the cells get refreshed, right? If you do more activations, meaning refresh interval is large, the probability of bit flip is high, as you can see over here in real system results. Right? So we showed that if you want to get rid of every single bit flip we've seen in these chips with our methodology, 
you need to increase the refresh rate by 7x. That's a lot, basically. So increasing the refresh rate is not a great solution, as you can see over here. And these are not the worst case attacks that you can do. We're doing single-sided hammering. Double-sided will make that 7x worse, basically. Okay, so data pattern is another interesting thing. I've already animated it. But basically, if the data pattern looks like this in memory, you get fewer errors. If the data pattern looks like this, you get a lot more errors. This is because of the voltage coupling, again, between the cells, uh, or capacitance coupling between the cells. And the coupling is higher if the cells are charged in different ways, usually opposite. Okay? And this data pattern needs to be discovered, of course. Uh, so data pattern matters, as you can see. And this is true for refresh retention time as well. Okay, so there are a bunch of other observations that we make in this paper. Victim cells, basically row hammer vulnerable cells are very different from retention weak cells. So if a cell gets, so if you, if you reduce the refresh rate, a cell uh, uh, is vulnerable to errors, right? That's called retention vulnerability. These cells that are vulnerable to retention vulnerability are very different from cells that are vulnerable to row hammer because these are very different uh, error mechanisms. It's important to see that. And again, if you're interested, you can talk to Hao Song because he has a lot of data related to it. Right, Hao Song? Okay, good. <laughs> now he's uh, doing a parallel processing. <laughs> okay, and then errors are repeatable. And this makes it a security problem, actually, uh, because uh, now you can figure out which cells are vulnerable and induce bit flips in those cells. So this could be a, a, because security problems happen if you can identify which cells are vulnerable and attack them. And later works actually took advantage of this. You get as many as four errors per cache line. So simple error correcting codes that are used to detect and correct, let's say, one error, one bit, is not enough. And this number has increased. This is, these are studies from 2012 to 2014. Keep that in mind. Like the paper you're going to present is going to show a lot more errors. OK, so cells, affect, cells are affected by two aggressors on either side. I said this. So this leads to double side hammering, basically. There's a lot more results in this paper that I'm not going to talk about, but you can read it if you're interested. So row hammer is getting much worse, and we're going to cover this paper. I'm going to mention this a little bit uh, today also. But later, we did the study uh, because we wanted to understand what's happening to row hammer. And the one of the major reasons why we did the study was because manufacturers claim that row hammer is sold. They're done. And we wanted to see whether that's correct or not. And I'm going to talk about that. And uh, there are actually more row hammer dimensions that need to be studied, one of them being what you mentioned, which is briefly studied in this work, but there's more to do in that area. And there are other things that need to be studied, like what's the effect of voltage, etc. OK, now let's take a, a step aside and talk about solutions. Any questions on understanding? We're going to talk a little more about understanding later on. And the paper, one of the papers that's going to be presented is going to be about understanding it. But let's talk about solutions. So solutions uh, initially uh, uh, that were developed, uh, first of all, there needs to be two kinds of solutions, right? There are some chips that are vulnerable in the field. How do you protect them? Uh, unfortunately, there are very limited possibilities here because today's memory controllers are not programmable. You cannot program them easily. Uh, basically, it's not like software. You send a software patch and you correct the error. Unfortunately, we cannot do that in the memory controller because the memory controller doesn't run any software that's patchable. It's really hard-coded hardware. There's very, very limited programmability by changing the refresh rate. And that's the solution that's going to be employed in the immediate term. But the longer term, of course, now you can actually change a lot of things, right? Potential DRAM chips can be changed, which is happening right now. Memory controllers can be changed, which is also happening. So both of them can be changed. So in our original work, we proposed both types of solutions. I'm not going to go over all of these solutions, but one of these solutions is proposed as the best solution. It's already employed. Variants of it is already employed in the field. But it's not good enough, as we will see. So uh, one solution could be make better DRAM chips, like figure out some material that's different, such that you don't, we're not vulnerable to the problem. Unfortunately, we don't know how to do that. Or even if we know, it's very costly to manufacture that material. Increase the spacing. Make sure isolation is there. All of these actually impact costs. Some people propose, oh, why do we actually use DDR3? Use old chips with old technology. These are non-solutions, right? This is basically going backwards. That going backwards is not a solution, for example. Uh, refreshing frequently, uh, this is the solution that's employed in the field, as I will show you. Uh, but it's not a great solution because it's called, we want to get rid of these refreshes. As I said, right? we build this infrastructure to get rid of these refreshes. If you're at the cutting edge, you want to get rid of refreshes, not introduce more refreshes. Right? That's the idea, basically. Let me put it that way. Sophisticated error correction codes, again, these are uh, expensive in general in terms of cost, power, area, latency, etc. And also, there's a fundamental problem I have with error correcting codes in general. Uh, is this the right solution for the problem? 
So the problem we're dealing with is a very particular problem that's access pattern related. It's not a random error. A random error, like error correction codes were developed and put into memories to deal with random errors whose cause we don't know. A cosmic race, right? this is the famous example, a cosmic race strikes uh, some machine uh, and you get a bit flip. There's no other way of detecting this. Error correcting codes or duplicating memory. That's another way, basically. Error correcting codes are a smarter way of duplicating memory. It's you, you're doing some coding so that you don't have to duplicate memory completely. Uh, so in this particular case, I think fundamentally error correcting codes are the wrong approach because you know there's a specific problem and access, access pattern related. You can develop a much more efficient solution to it than protecting the entire memory with something that's really designed for random error correction. Okay, so that's important. Again, if you took, if you took DDCA, you know how I care about principal design. So whenever uh, people propose error correcting codes, uh, I get a bit wary at this. <laughs> Now, error correcting codes can be employed in conjunction with some other methods. Now, that's a different issue. But directly uh, using error correcting codes for this problem doesn't make a lot of if, uh, sense in terms of efficiency to me. Okay, access counters. In, in our initial paper, we kind of dismissed the solution, saying that this is too costly, too complex. But I believe that this needs to be re-examined today, and people are re-examining it. Access counters means figure out which rows are accessed by how much or how many times, and try to do something about it. If you for example, you have counters inside the memory or inside the memory controller. These counters tell you how many times each row is accessed. Of course, you can be smart about allocating these counters. You don't have to keep track of every single row. Uh, you can use bloom filters, as we will see. And if you figure that out, uh, refresh the adjacent rows to this row, for example, or throttle accesses to this row. Does that make sense? So you can basically reduce the uh, impact of those rows. Okay. So what was employed in the field was increasing the refresh rate. This is Apple security patch. Apple is nice because they actually accredited the, the real research that they worked uh, from. Uh, and in the end, they increase the memory refresh rates, but they don't say by how much. Likely 2x, which is not enough to cover all of the bit flips that you can see as we have seen earlier, right? Based on our testing. Because if, you, if they increase it by 7x or 8x, it's going to be a mess. It's going to be a lot of overhead. Okay, our solution, let me give you the key idea, uh, was probabilistic adjacent row activation. And the idea is very simple. After the memory controller closes the row, it activates or refreshes one or both of the neighbors of the row with a low probability. And you can see the probability can be like this. And you can adjust this probability, it's a programmable value. And we showed that with a reasonable probability value that looks like this, you get error rate that's very, very low, let's say. And if, you don't, if you're not comfortable with that error rate, increase the probability. So there's a trade-off between error rates and performance overhead and power overhead. And this trade-off exists in flash memory, for example, in SSDs. That trade-off is already made. Yeah. In DRAM, it's made, never told to anyone, but <laughs> now we need to make it more explicitly. OK, so basically, the advantages of this sort of solution is it's low power, low performance overhead, as we showed. It's stateless. You don't need to keep track of any room. That was what really attracted us to the solution, basically. Don't keep track of anything. Just do this probabilistically. Uh, and we show that it's an effective and lower red solution given the state of the row hammer at that time. But today we're in a very different state. Technology did not uh, scale very well. And this is actually a high overhead solution as we will discuss. So this can be implemented with the DRAM chip as well as the memory control. And both versions were implemented over time actually. So how is it done in the DRAM chip? There's enough slack in the timing and refresh parameters. So you can sneak in some of these refreshes uh, at some point. If implemented in the memory controller, it's a bit more difficult because memory controller needs to know which rows are physically adjacent to DM. And we, as I showed you earlier, we don't have this knowledge. So there needs to be some more coordination. And we always argued for that sort of coordination in our research, basically. There should be more coordination between memory and the memory controller so that they can do things in a better way. OK, hopefully that's happening going forward, but we'll see. So this was uh, one Intel system that employed probabilistic adjacent row activation. Uh, so you can pick your, uh, in the bias, it's not exactly how we envisioned it, but uh, they had a bias level solution. Basically in the bias, you can pick your solution. You can take, you can say either 2X refresh, you can see that it's not, it's only 2X uh, and hardware row hammer protection and hardware row hammer protection. Uh, you can pick your row hammer activation probability that would induce uh, these refreshes, additional refreshes. So this was a memory controller based solution. Unfortunately, Intel kind of stopped going there, through this direction because at some point, the manufacturer said, we solved the problem. Rove hammer is gone. 
you don't need to worry about it. And we're going to talk about that. Okay, so if you're interested, uh, you can read this paper. Okay, so basically what we argued and what para is an example of, probably get zero example uh, is an example of is an intelligent control, slightly intelligent control that tries to deal with these areas. We're going to see a lot more intelligent controllers that were proposed uh, soon. So for example, this was uh, this flash related studies that we did. This is this was our flash memory infrastructure that we used and did a lot of experiments on including read disturbance. But if you look at flash memory, there's a lot of intelligence in the memory controller that's designed for flash memory. It can actually inspect a lot of things that's going on in the flash memory because it doesn't have the same unfortunate, let's say, interface that we are dealing with processor and memory. Uh, and if you're interested in what goes on in the in a memory controller that's designed for flash memory, there's a lot over here. Maybe I'll, I'll get back to this later on. Okay, so I'm going to. So basically, uh, let's say uh, at around 2020, uh, DM manufacturers, as I said, said they solved the problem and. Uh, we wrote this paper uh, saying that this needs more solutions and better solutions going into the future. Uh, who was right? Any questions? So now I'm going to talk about what happened in 2022, 2022, but maybe it should be 2023. So I want to change it and mess up this setup. It was not that bad. Ah. Why does it automatically go into the presenter view? Okay, there must be some setting. Okay, so uh, so what happened, let's say, in 2020, 2003? Uh, I must also say that DM manufacturers uh, were quite secretive about all of this, uh, which is interesting because in 2023, they're writing papers about it. There's a paper from SK Hynix in the ISSCC conference. This is the first paper that was written by a major manufacturer that clearly uses the term rope hammer. And then there's another paper on archive from Samsung that uses exactly the same term, Rohan. Finally, they're writing papers about it. But in 2019, 20, it was not the case. Basically, they were saying, they were saying we solved the problem. In fact, I gave an invited talk at a supercomputing conference. I talked about Rohammer in memory processing. And then uh, a pretty, very, very, quite senior person from Micron, Micron is the third major VM manufacturer, was the next speaker. Uh, he basically came up to the stage and said, we have a solution to row power. It consists of three letters. Can you guess what those three letters are? E, C, C. Very correct in quotes. <laughs> but we know that it's not a solution, right? This was, this was 2016, by the way. I'm not gonna name that person. <laughs> I think fundamentally he's good, but sometimes these people get into this company mindset that literally messes up things. Okay, <laughs> okay, but basically, uh, we wanted to re-examine Rohammer and figure out really what's going on. Are the DM manufacturers correct? Did they solve the problem? Or is this problem actually fundamentally easily solvable? Those were the two questions that we wanted to ask. And this first, this first paper looks at the second question. Is this problem fundamentally solvable? Where are we heading in Rohammer? If you get rid of all of the Rohammer solutions that are introduced, okay, assuming they work or they don't work, we don't care. Let's get rid of them. Let's disable them in the chips and let's test the chips. So you're going to present this paper, so I don't want to <laughs> present it in detail. But basically, the takeaways from this work is that it's getting much worse. And the problem is not easily solved, basically. Uh, we tested more than 1,500 chips. And we found out that newer DRAM chips are much more vulnerable to hammer. There are more bit flips that we see that are happening earlier. And there are new chips whose weakest cells fail after only 4,800 hammers. And basically, it's getting much worse. And existing mitigation mechanisms are not effective at future technology nodes. There is no mitigation mechanism that's, in, that's described in literature that's good when your row hammer threshold, when, when for example, you hammer a row 1,000 times and you get a bit flip, there's no mechanism that actually works well. Either they don't work at that number or they actually induce a huge overhead in terms of performance. So again, we built a bunch of infrastructures to test. You're gonna maybe talk about those next week or two weeks later. Is it two weeks later? Yeah, two weeks later. And again, you, you can go over this more, but basically we did a huge scaling study of lots of chips, different standards, as you can see. Uh, and we found essentially the same thing across all of the chips. The thing is, the problem is getting much worse. Uh, for example, this uh, picture shows the row hammer bit flip rate. This is the hammer count on the x-axis. This is row hammer bit flip rate. And these are chips uh, that belong to different generations. So you can see that going uh, lower is worse. 
uh, as we go uh, as we go from DDR4 chips to DDR, uh, DDR, uh, new DDR4 chips, the curve shifts to the left, meaning the first bit flip happens earlier with fewer hammers, and also to the uh, curve shifts up high, meaning at a given a hammer count, you get more bit flips. And that's true for across all manufacturers, as you can see. And this is a large scale study of chips. I mean, large scale from what we can do, right? It's 1500 chips, it's not easy. To date, I believe this is one of the highest numbers, but maybe Hassan can correct me if he has more chips that he's testing for his new papers. <laughs> I think the answer is no. Okay, basically it's difficult to test 1500, that number of chips. Okay, uh, basically technology is on, not on your side. So what's going on? Are the DM manufacturers correct? We'll see that. Okay, I'm going to skip these uh, because I've said already these. And then the other study that we did in this paper was to evaluate the mitigation mechanisms. So basically these are uh, different mitigation mechanisms and their performance impact, system performance impact. 100 is the best performance. If you go to 0%, you basically are not running your program anymore. Uh, so uh, for example, uh, this is increasing the refresh rate. Increasing the refresh rate is not a good solution to get rid of all errors because your performance goes down to 20% of the level of what you would really want to be. You should really stay at 100% if you don't want to lose any performance dealing with row hammer, right? And you can see that para, our solution we propose para, gets much worse after 1000 or even earlier than 1000, depending on how much performance loss you can tolerate, right? So only mechanism that scales is para, but it gets very bad if the row hammer bit flips happen after 100. Uh, hammers, for example. And then there's some other mechanisms that just don't work. And there's an ideal mechanism that's actually not bad, uh, but there's significant opportunity basically in developing a solution, but we don't know what that solution is. This is in 2020 again. Okay, there are lectures on this also. So that's what this paper showed. And this paper in conjunction with the next one that I'm going to describe actually finally let the DM manufacturers get to their senses because people read this paper and also the next paper, they basically said, we got to solve this problem. And the people who really initiated was not, unfortunately, the DM manufacturers. This was really the companies like Microsoft, Google, and Facebook telling the DM manufacturers, look what's going on. And these, that's, what the, that's the beauty of doing research in academia that can influence in industry, in my opinion. In this case, that's exactly what happened. OK, so this next paper is trespass. This, uh, basically, here we wanted to, under, uh, as I said, in this previous paper, we want to understand fundamentally what's going on with Rohammer, ignoring all the solutions. Here we wanted to understand, DM manufacturers said, well, we solved the problem. Is that really true? Is the problem really solved? Can we actually induce it, be, these bit flips that are sold by DM manufacturers uh, as Rohammer free? And the answer is basically yes, you can induce bit flips. So they did not solve the problem. They just claimed that they solved the problem. Uh, okay, so this is the first work that showed that these protected DM chips are vulnerable to Rohammer in the field. So protections are called TRR. This is in the standard, in DM standard, they added this TRR, target draw refresh. It's a very nebulous concept. Uh, just to give uh, leeway to the manufacturers to implement whatever they want, in my opinion. Uh, but basically, it's a way of refreshing targeted rows due to Rohammer. Uh, so uh, DM manufacturers implemented some solutions, no question about that. Uh, but unfortunately, their mitigations were not secure. Uh, so in a sense, because they did not really advertise their solutions, publicize their solutions, they were really uh, resorting to security by obscurity. So there are different ways of getting security, right? You can be fundamentally secure, provably secure, or you cannot, you don't prove anything. You just say, we did something and live with it. That's what they did basically. This is called security by obscurity. Somehow you obfuscate things or obscure things. But unfortunately, they couldn't obscure enough because you can actually find out things about these DRAM chips using infrastructure like ours, right? So this work introduced to the memory side row hammer attack. So the idea is to hammer many rows to bypass these mitigations that are internal to the DRAM chips. For example, there could be a mitigation that detects some aggressor rows inside the DRAM chip. If you, if you actually attack many rows, you can, you, can, uh, you can basically overflow those tables that are trying to detect those rows. And you're back to square one. Basically, you can induce these bit flips. I will show you a little bit more. This paper is not going to be presented this time, but in the past incarnations, we actually did uh, this. And this also partially reverse engineered the mechanisms that are uh, implemented in the EM chips and memory controllers. And we actually released an automatic tool that can effectively create these attacks. So you can actually play with this. Uh, of course, there are newer tools. There's actually more research in this area, which is really moving fast. There are newer tools that build on trespass. 
Okay, let me give you an example. So this is a double-sided pattern. Red ones are aggressor rows, uh, blue ones are victim rows. This is double-sided, but then you can have a third row that is an assist. So there are actually three rows hammering right now. Here you have a four-sided hammer. You have four rows that are being hammered. And the sole purpose of this is to make sure that you bypass the mitigations that are internal. So let's take a look at that. So you can, these are data from real chips. Uh, so, so for example, in this particular module, we get bit flips if we hammer five rows. We get bit flips if we hammer 13 rows, but there are no bit flips if we hammer one, two, three, four rows. Right? It's interesting. So there's some noise. We don't completely understand everything, but there's some explanation in the paper, if you can see. In this particular chip, you need to hammer nine rows to get bit flips. Okay. So the reason we were able to actually understand this is because of this infrastructure. If you did not have this FPGA-based infrastructure, this would be a nightmare to really induce. Uh, so based on experiments we did with our FPGA-based infrastructure by turning off the refresh, turning off the refresh actually uh, turns off all these protection mechanisms. And by reading the paper, you can figure out what's going on. We discovered that there are two components to the NDM target row protection mechanisms. One is a sampler, which tracks aggressor row activations. And this could be designed multiple ways. It could be frequency-based. Let's say it can record every nth row activation. It could be time-based. It can record n row activations. Or it could be randomly, similar to para. Regardless, the sampler has a limited size. And that's what we're going to exploit in the attack. Inhibitor is inhibitor takes action based on what's discovered by the sampler. It basically prevents bit flips by refreshing victim rows. And uh, as I said, the latency of performing victim row refresh is squeezed into slack time available, as we discussed earlier, right? In the refresh command base. So if you understand this enough, you can actually develop uh, uh, an attack. And that's what we did. I'm not going to go into the details of it. You can read the paper again. But you can see that we found out that 13 of the 42 modules we tested, we can induce bit flips. And that's enough. That was enough for us. We declared victory because if the manufacturers were correct, none of these modules, we should be able to induce any bit flip, right? But we were able to induce bit flips in at least one module of all manufacturers. Uh, so you can see the best pattern is different uh, for different manufacturers and different chips also. Okay, and we were able to show that you could actually do this on real mobile phones. You can actually take over the system and you can read the paper for more details. And the attacks can be relatively quick. These are some attacks that were done in literature. For example, PT page table entry attack is very similar to the Google's attack, RSA 2048. This recovers the private key of uh, the uh, encryption uh, procedure. And then there's a pseudo attack. You can read again uh, for those. But you can see that very quickly you can take over the system or achieve the goal you're trying to achieve uh, with the attack that you're doing uh, on real modules. Make sense? And we were not exhaustive, basically. Uh, that's what this last part is about. So basically, the key results of this work is that uh, the, the mitigations that are advertised to be secure to protect against row hammer are not really there. Well, they're there, but they're not secure. And mobile phones are vulnerable. DM mods are vulnerable. And these results are actually scratching the surface. Our tool was not exhaustive, but it was very important that we publish this so that something really gets moving, let's say. So we could have, for example, waited to make sure we get bit flips in every chip. But what's the, what's the point in that? The, the extra engineering effort that's required for that is not worth, let's say, uh, what we're trying to do over here. So it's always good to think about that. Is that when, when is that paper really ready? Would this paper uh, be better written one year later with the extra engineering effort to actually show bit flips in every single DM chip that we tested? I don't think so. Then we would be one year away from industry really getting their act together and acting to solve the problem. Right? Okay. Uh, so, but uh, other people could use the trash pass tool and do more attacks, let's say. So, basically, what this work and uh, together with the revisiting Rohammer showed that Rohammer is still an open problem and security by obscurity is not a good solution. Okay. So, there's detailed lectures also. Any questions? Yes. Go ahead. That's a great question. <laughs> I think, uh, okay, uh, there are two answers. Fundamentally, it has to be, no question about that, uh, because DDR5 uh, is a newer technology generation. As a result, uh, the, uh, unless the uh, manufacturers are doing something like at the circuit level that's better, uh, fundamentally, you should be vulnerable. Now, are there solutions that are employed uh, that are going to be better than trespass? 
Uh, I believe hopefully yes, because there is more flexibility in the DDR5 standard. There's something called RFM refresh management. It's a messy command again, but that gives a little bit more flexibility to the memory controller to deal with things. But again, is that the final solution? It's not clear. It's not basically we don't know what exactly is implemented uh, today. And nobody's claiming that it's not vulnerable. So they're not making this, the industry is not making the same mistake today. Yes, you had another question? Um, are there actually any well known, um, well known incidents where a specific way for row number is leveraged by black attackers to launch? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, no one has reported anything, but again, that doesn't mean that uh, it may not have happened, right? We don't know. Yeah. With, with hardware security vulnerabilities, it's always like that, right? With Meltdown and Spectre, for example, which were a huge deal in 2018 19. Again, there's no documented case of something like that. Yes. Overall, is like a pattern of zero to one or one to zero being more common? Yeah, so let's discuss in the papers. Uh, yeah, I think one of the patterns is more common, but that depends on the encoding also. That depends on a bunch of things, how, how the values are encoded inside the chip, as well as how that gets expressed uh, to the programmer. Yeah, so I think we reported in our paper, but also may have more data on that. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's very complicated. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there are a lot of things. So there's like the so first we have the Schumann and Tarkov thing. So it's uh, like a cell can be encoded. Uh, let's say a logical one can be encoded either as like charge or no charge. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. charge or 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 no charge. And second, we have the let's say assume a combined leakage pass let's say the destination for this leakage pass like if it's the uh, bit line or other sources like the final leakage voltage will be different mm -hmm. that will also affect like which di which di uh, direction is more dominant mm -hmm. and finally we have let's say yeah just uh, the the data pattern will also mm -hmm. affect like whether one kind is uh, dominant compared to the other, and finally we have like yeah whatever the process technology that manufacturers using it might have a lot, lot of different uh, physics in there. Exactly. Yeah. So there are a lot of circuit and device level effects, and it's fine. You, you you can you can you remember how many times you said finally? There's another more finally coming up <laughs> that will affect things. <laughs> so there are a lot of basically components to it. Uh, it's it's difficult to yeah. But those are good questions, basically. Those are things that uh, are studied, being studied, and need to be studied more. OK, so how to guarantee that a chip is row hammer free? I'm not going to talk about this, but we did some work with Microsoft uh, also on this one. And it's actually interesting. There's no, uh, we wanted to understand uh, from a, let's say, data center perspective, what are the access patterns that you can do in a program that lead to more bit flips? And there are some interesting results here. And there's no way to actually guarantee that your row hammer chip that you're employing in your data centers uh, that the chip that you're employing in your deploying in your data center is row hammer free. So uh, later we actually wanted to do more work to really understand what's going on inside the chip. So trespass work showed that uh, solutions are not are poor, but how poor are they? Basically, can we develop a methodology to uncover uh, the underlying protection mechanism in the engines? And that's what this paper does. I will not go into it in a lot of detail, but this basically introduced a new methodology that leverages data retention failures to uncover how the TRR mechanisms internally really work, enable us to study their security. So we showed in this work that you can actually craft new row hammer access patterns based on this understanding. You can almost completely reverse engineer what's happening inside the chip, inside the DRM chip to protect against row hammer. And basically all of the modules that we tested are vulnerable. And you get a lot of bit flips, as you can see, and you get up to seven row hammer bit flips in one eight bit data word, essentially ECC is ineffective in this case. And if in order to protect for this using ECC, you need to have seven bits correcting error, uh, seven bit error correcting codes. And that's expensive as you can imagine. <laughs> so, okay. So we've open sourced this also. So the, the key idea in this work is to use data retention failures as a side channel to detect when a row is refreshed by TRR. Basically here we're combining our understanding of data retention behavior uh, with our understanding of row ham. So we identify some rows that 
should not retain their data unless they're refreshed. And we turn off the refresh. If the, uh, we turn off the refresh for those rows, and if somehow those rows retain data, that means that there's some internal mechanism that refreshed those rows. So now we have a side channel. Right? So we can figure out uh, the data retention time of all rows, and we can use this information to uncover when the TR mechanism is kicking in. And for, with that information, with this sort of key idea, you can uncover almost everything inside a chip. And of course, we develop this infrastructure. Uh, so this enables us to uh, get uh, or construct new row hammer access patterns that circumvent the TRR. And now you can see, actually, these are three major manufacturers, ABC. And you can see that they employ uh, different aggressor detection mechanisms. Some of them use counters. Some of them use random sampling some of them, or some sort of sampling, not necessarily random. Some of them use a mix. Aggressor capacity, how many rows they're tracking is different. 16 over here, one. Whether the tracker is per bank or not per bank is different. And when does the TRR uh, or row hammer protection mechanism kick in compared to the refreshes that are generated uh, by the memory controller? What is the ratio of that? Again, you can see those are different. How many neighbors are refreshed? Some, some manufacturers, you can see refresh four neighbors just two, as opposed to just two neighbors because row hammer effect actually is present uh, th this is called a blast radius by industry. Basically, not only the immediately adjacent rows are affected, but other rows are also affected by row hammer to a lesser extent, of course. So these manufacturers are refreshing four rows, as you can see over here. And these are the uh, rows that are vulnerable, maximum bit flips that we observe using our access patterns. And you can see the real HC first numbers for these. And these are relatively low, as you can see. HC first is when do you get the first row hammer bit flips after how many hammer counts? You can see it's 6K, 7K over here, double sided. So basically, you can almost completely reverse engineer everything. This is the next step after the trespass work, if you will. OK, I will not uh, go into a lot of the detail, but essentially, you can induce lots of row hammer bit flips. Uh, and I believe, actually, if you put a little bit more work over here, all of these numbers can increase, in my opinion. We didn't do a lot of work, for example, on manufacturer C. Uh, I believe you can reverse engineer. And their mechanisms are a little bit more complicated, actually, than manufacturers A and B. Uh, but if you actually put more effort, more reverse engineering effort, I believe you can actually find out more and craft better access patterns to circumvent. So this is what an attacker could do. They can actually analyze uh, these different modules and they can actually craft attacks that are specialized for them. And ECC is not effective as you can see over here. This is the bit flip counts. This is essentially, uh, yeah, modules from all three vendors have eight byte data chunks with three and more up to seven row higher bit flips. So conventional DMECC, even strong DMECC cannot protect against this easily today. Okay, there's a lot more in the paper, but we don't have time for it. So these are the kind of studies that I mentioned by fundamentally understanding. There's more to do to understand row hammer. Yes. These are for the physical, yeah. Because it's in the, inside the DRAM itself and DRAM manufacturers know exactly uh, how they map internally uh, the different roles. Okay. So uh, let's talk about some new row hammer characteristics. And this is something that is really important to examine going into the future. We need to understand this more. Uh, and we did the study for uh, the micro 2021 conference uh, that talks about three major effects on row hammer. One is temperature. The other is related to something you mentioned somewhat, aggressor row active time, how long you can keep the row aggress uh, aggressor row active. And then the other is related to physical uh, location of the DRAM cells. So uh, we can go into more detail, but let me see. Okay, we still have time. <laughs> and you can feel free to ask questions also. But basically, we enhanced our infrastructure for this purpose. You can see that this infrastructure is more precise right now. The temperature control is within 0.1 degrees Celsius. That's important. And we did a lot of tests. Here, we, didn't, we were not able to test a lot of chips, partially because these tests are extremely uh, long tests. Uh, but you can see that uh, we actually tested four major manufacturers. But the fourth one is very small, actually. The DRAM market is dominated by the first three. They're not necessarily ordered in terms of how big they are. Samsung is the biggest, SK Inix is second, then Micron is the third. OK, so basically, this paper uh, looks at uh, uh, different things, as I said. And there are three major findings. One is a row hammer bit flip is more likely to occur in a bounded range of temperature that's specific to a cell. So unfortunately, this calls for more understanding. Basically, we don't quite fully understand the relationship between temperature and 
vulnerability to raw hammer because it seems to be very, very self specific. But it happens to be happen uh, at a bounded range of temperature, and the bounded range is different for different cells, essentially. So there needs to be more here. Uh, second, if the aggressor row is kept active longer, uh, this leads to more bit flips, uh, and there's more uh, to do in this area. And some certain physical regions of DRAM are a lot more vulnerable than other physical regions. So all of these can be used by the attacker or the defender. Attacker can use this to craft more att effective attacks, and the defender or protector, let's say, can uh, uh, use this to design more effective and efficient defenses. Let's take a look at this relatively quickly. So for example, this is uh, an X access pattern where you're activating aggressor rows as frequently as possible. Row A is active, row B is active, row A is active. You're doing double side hammering. Here, we're activating row A for some time, keeping it open for a while, and then waiting uh, after that, we're activating row B. It turns out if you do this, this leads to more bit flips for circuit level reasons that we briefly mentioned in the paper. So this is a better access pattern for an attacker. So attacker can actually induce bit flips earlier. And this is bad for the defender because if the defender assumed or, or put in a defense, assuming this sort of aggressor activation pattern, then bit flips will happen a lot earlier than expected. And the defense may not be able to catch that. So that's why it's really important to really understand what's going on. And there's more here. And if you're really interested in this, talk to Hassan. Okay, spatial variation. Uh, as I said, uh, row hammer vulnerability significantly varies across rows as well as columns because of manufacturing induced variation. Uh, and yeah, uh, making, you can read the paper for more detail, but this is a, a pictorial demonstration. Uh, on the y axis, you see the HC first hammer count, minimum activation count to observe a bit flip. On the x-axis, you have DRMO sorted by reducing HC first. And you can see that uh, there's a huge variation, right? Across DRM rows, there's a big variation. Across DRM modules, there's a big variation also. So these are different manufacturers. They all uh, see a huge variation. Some rows are very vulnerable over here. Some rows are not so vulnerable over here. OK, there's more data on this. And you can see more details. Again, I'm going to skip this because I gave you the major observation. That's true for rows. That's true for columns also. Some columns are a lot more vulnerable than other columns. And again, the reasons for this, we don't fully understand. Uh, part of the reason is basically manufacturing variation, right? Different, uh, different wires and different cells have different vulnerability because of manufacturing variation. Maybe there's no, and as far as we can see, there's no exact pattern uh, to these. But if you can somehow figure this out, uh, you can make your defenses a lot more efficient. Basically, today's defenses are assuming the worst case. So every row, wh what does that mean? Every row is as vulnerable as the worst possible row that would get bit flips. Worst possible row gets bit flips with 1,000 uh, activations, for example. If you assume that your defense needs to cater for every rows with the same protection capability. But if most of the rows are not that vulnerable, and that's what we see basically, 90% of the rows are half as vulnerable with this metric, HC first metric, then you can reduce the aggressiveness of the solutions. This leads to significant area reduction in tracking aggressor rows. So these are two mechanisms. I'm going to discuss one of them that basically track aggressor rows and refresh victim rows or throttle aggressor rows to protect against row hammer. Their tracking mechanism can be made much more efficient. So this is an interesting direction also. And then there's the temperature, but I'm not going to talk about that. There's interesting observations here. OK, so this work basically goes deeper into row hammer, as you can see, and uncovers some things that we didn't know about. Any questions? And whatever you uncover, it's always good to think it could be used by the attacker and it could be used by the defender. It's always that uh, dual. And if you're interested, you can watch Gear video. So let's talk about more row hammer analysis. Very briefly, we also wanted to understand the effect of word line voltage on row hammer. So we updated our testing infrastructure such that we can, in a fine grain manner, change the word line voltage. So I can see the power of this sort of infrastructure right now. This is the infrastructure uh, that uh, uh, doesn't exist anywhere else in the world, let's say, except the open sources, of course, so people can build it if they want to. But this sort of infrastructure enables us to understand things at the cutting edge. So this work basically shows that if you reduce the word line voltage, this is reducing the activation voltage. So this is reducing, intuitively, this should reduce the impact of row hammer bit flips, right? And that's what we see, basically. This reduces row hammer vulnerability. Unfortunately, it also adds 
some not so nice effects, like it increases the activation latency because voltage is lower. And it also reduces data retention time. And we discussed this in the paper. I believe you can get to a better situation by considering all of these, uh, but I don't believe this is the final solution. So reducing the word line voltage, we wanted to understand the effect and we did achieve that understanding, but I don't think you can actually do a lot with the reducing word line voltage. And that's also really important to understand in my opinion. Okay, so you can watch another talk of GRI. Now let's talk about solutions. So I'm going to talk about block hammer solution. This is something we developed. And uh, this was uh, a finalist in Intel's Hardware Security Academy, Academic Award contest last year, or maybe this year, well, for 2021, let's say. But before I go into it, let me talk about these solution approaches. So uh, this is another slide that talks about solution approaches more broadly. So the first one I'm going to dismiss the second one I'm going to dismiss because there's good data that shows that these are very difficult to do today. The third one I'm going to dismiss for different reasons. So people have proposed physical isolation. Why don't we isolate aggressor rows from victim rows? Just put some buffer rows between them, right? Now this wastes a lot of memory, clearly a lot of inefficiency. This also is not perfectly secure as other works showed. And then the question becomes how many isolation rows do you need? How do you decide that? So this actually has a lot of hairy issues. Uh, and then there are two major solutions that I believe are interesting. Uh, which is reactive refresh, uh, figure out which rows are rapidly activated in some way, count accesses to them, for example, or do para, probabilistic adjacent row activation. It doesn't count them, but it probabilistically uh, figures that out. And then refresh the adjacent rows. Right? So this has some problem because if you implement the memory controller, uh, you need to know the mappings. And then there's this other solution which had not been examined to a lot of, to great detail, which is proactive throttling figure out which rows are activated a lot, throttle accesses to them. Instead of refreshing the victim rows, throttle access to these rows. Now this is good because this doesn't require you to know which rows are adjacent. So this could be easily implemented in the memory controller. That's why proactive throttling is nice. So all of these actual solutions are interesting because they all have a trade-off between cost, power, performance, and complexity. So the perfect solution to row hammer is not known yet. All of the solutions are a trade-off. Of course, there's security also which ones are fundamentally secure. You need to prove the security of your solution as well. So this is what we wanted to target with the Black Hammer work. I kind of gave you the idea, but we wanted to make sure the solution is scalable as row hammer vulnerability becomes worse into the future. And we wanted to make sure the solution is compatible with commodity DRAM chips. We don't want to know which rows are physically adjacent. We don't want any information from the DRAM chip and we want to be able to implement this in a memory controller, let's say, without information from the DRAM chip. So that's the idea. And without modification to DRAM interface also. So the key idea is selectively throttle memory access that may cause row hammer bit flips. At the high level, uh, we use area efficient bloom filters uh, to detect which rows are being hammered a lot. And you selectively throttle accesses from within the memory control, stop accesses to those rows basically for some time. Of course, to be secure, you need to make sure you detect every row that may cause bit flips and also you throttle it long enough such that you don't get bit flips. And the paper discusses that I'm not going to go into exactly how this works, but bit flips do not occur in the end. There's a security proof. Uh, and optionally, if you do this, you have an advantage because now you know which rows may be hammered and you can, you, can, you can inform the software. And I think this is really important going into the future. If there's some row hammer type of attack that may be happening, informing the software could be useful, right? Okay, I already said this. There's no need for proprietary information or modification to DRAM chip with this sort of solution. So there are two components to this. One is row blocker that tracks row activation rates through area efficient bloom filters and blacklist rows that are activated at a high rate and throttles activations targeting a blacklisted row. All in the memory controller. No row can be activated at a high enough rate to induce bit flips, okay? Attack throttler is some other component. This identifies threads that perform a row hammer attack. It reduces the memory bandwidth usage for those threads such that non-attacking threads can use memory better. And this is really important. And this is one distinction of block hammer compared to other solutions. This greatly reduces the performance degradation and the energy waste that a row hammer attack inflicts on the system. And based on this, you can optionally report it uh, to the operating system. Okay, so we did a lot of evaluation of many state-of-the-art mechanisms uh, uh, of many different metrics like system throughput, job turnaround time, unfairness across different applications, DM energy consumption. And it turns out block hammer's performance energy overheads remain negligible. Uh, less than 1% in this case. Uh, and also, uh, this is when no row hammer attack is present. When row hammer attack is present, block hammer actually is better than other solutions because 
it reduces the impact of the attack uh, on the system. It reduces by, by providing less memory bandwidth to an attacking threat. So you get more performance and more and less energy consumption. So it sounds good, right? Uh, and if you're interested, the paper has a lot of actually analysis of different types of protection uh, against draw hammer. Again, I'm not going to talk about that, but we, since we don't have time. Uh, okay, this is also open source, uh, and you can actually uh, build on it. If people are interested in solving row hammer, uh, there's a lot of actually open source material that we have, and there's a lot of uh, expertise in the group uh, from multiple people. So if you're excited about doing something like this, definitely talk to us. Because this is not this does not completely solve the problem. Why? You may say basically the hardware cost is still high. Even though the hardware cost is more scalable compared to other mechanisms, unfortunately, it's still pretty high. And it's a bit less complex than other mechanisms. So competing mechanisms, for example, graphene is a very competing mechanism. It uses a frequent item detection algorithm, uh, Mises Reguiz algorithm that's proposed in the literature, adapts it to hardware. Uh, it's nice uh, conceptually, etc. It has a security proof just like Rockheimer has, uh, but it's very complicated to design in hardware, actually. But it's a good solution, I think. The major problem with these solutions is the hardware cost and the complexity right now. Uh, so there's a lot more room, in my opinion, to uh, solve Rockheimer. Okay, but we can also look at the open source code because we released open uh, Blockheimer open source along with state, six state of the art mechanisms. Okay, so this is an example of another intelligent control. This is what I was really referring to with intelligent control. Now we have an intelligent control that's keeping track of which rows are being activated a lot and doing something about it. Much more intelligent than para. And para is more intelligent than existing memory controllers. Okay, let's take a look at these solution approaches again. So we need to, I think, solve row hammer in, in better ways. What, what else can we do? Uh, so people have proposed actually row migration based row hammer dependencies. That's not included in these solution approaches because there's not enough space in the slide. <laughs> Somehow we need to reconstruct the slide. But basically, these are migrating roles. This is an interesting approach. And the idea is to dynamically remap an aggressor row address to a different physical row before a row hammer with flip occurs. It doesn't re require refreshing the victim roles and it re reallocates the aggressor row data. So the way it was proposed in this work is you go through the memory controller. I don't think it's a very efficient approach. I don't like going through the memory controller unless it's needed. But there are a bunch of uh, these defenses. Uh, okay. I think these are not the latest version of the slides, I think. But fine. At least 2023 is correct. <laughs> or maybe I, I couldn't send you the latest version of the slides for some reason. Okay. So there are a bunch of these that are being proposed right now. Uh, yeah. Migration of rows is a little bit tricky, in my opinion, because once you start migrating rows, you actually cause a lot of data movement. That's another thing we want to get rid of, right? You don't want to be migrating uh, uh, rows all around the memory system a lot. So it's good to think about these principles, in my opinion. While this is good to explore the solution direction, I'm a bit skeptical that this is going to be really uh, uh, the solution to row hammer. It may be part of a solution when no other solution works, let's say. But uh, having this as the only solution to row hammer is a bit difficult to. Uh, really digest because you're causing a lot of data movement in the system, right? especially when your row hammer threshold is low. Imagine a system where after 100 activations, you get a bit. Now, even benign applications today are doing that almost. Some applications access rows, uh, activate a row 100 times within a refresh interval. So now you have a benign application, right? You, you, may have, you may be running multiple applications that are actually getting close to that limit or maybe exceeding that limit. They're not attackers, they're benign applications that you and I are running without any purpose of attack. Okay, so there's more row hammer in 2020 and 2023. I'm gonna uh, just show you what has happened. So there are a lot of papers that are being written. As you can see, there are sessions actually. And this is the uh, premier conference, IEEE security and privacy. There's a row hammer session, as you can see. Uh, major security conferences, major operating system menus actually talk about row hammer also. I didn't, I didn't include everything over here, actually. There was uh, some more uh, that I missed. There are attack papers, there are defense papers. You can see that there are papers. This is last year's IEEE Security and Privacy, uh, ASPLOS, HPCA, so even a Reliability Physics Symposium. So it's very interesting, I think, what people are doing. So this is a paper that was written by Google. I like this one because they basically show that uh, you can actually increase the bit flips uh, by, uh, enabling uh, another role. So by, by uh, 
by, by, enable, by, by assisting hammering from a row uh, that's a bit far away. That's the idea. So this basically takes into, uh, 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 takes into consideration the distance uh, from the row. It, it doesn't immediately hammer adjacent rows. Well, not a lot, but it hammers some other row that's a little bit farther away. And this, is, this helps as an assist. And they show that basically by doing this, you can, uh, some existing defenses can lead to attacks. Because existing defenses refresh adjacent rows. And if you're actually using those refreshes are activate, as activations that hammer that row, but helping that hammering with some other row that's a bit far away, these existing defenses that refresh adjacent rows can actually lead to attacks themselves. So that's the interesting part in this paper, in my opinion. So if you read this, uh, it's uh, very interesting. Yeah. So there are more works uh, that I'm not going to talk about, but uh, it's very interesting. So we've been doing works also. This is uh, GI's work. And we've been actually uh, writing papers that talk about more reliable, more transparency in the memory system. Let me talk about the solution relatively quickly. So it's an idea that's actually more general. We call it the self-managing DRAM chips. The basic idea is to enable autonomous operations in DRAM. Uh, so one of the reasons these, these solutions are difficult to implement and adopt in practice is DRAM doesn't have a lot of autonomy. Right? Memory control dictates everything that the DRAM does. The DRAM manufacturer is kind of in a bind, basically. They, they cannot do something that they know is good, even though they want to do it. Because the current interface between the processor and memory is not flexible. Processor dictates everything, or memory control dictates everything. Whenever the refresh is done, uh, whenever row hammer defense uh, gets activated, etc. So we basically argue that there needs to be more autonomy for DRAM. And the idea is, the key idea to enable this is to prevent the memory controller from accessing DRM regions that are under maintenance. DRM now has the capability to reject some commands, some activation commands. Memory control says, activate this row. DRM says, sorry, I cannot activate it. I'm under maintenance in this particular location. And you can bound this time, of course. Right? So that's the idea. You can add another pin to the DRM chip for this. That's the cost. And uh, leveraging this ability to reject an activation and maintenance operation can be implemented completely within a DRM chip. And this maintenance operation, what is the maintenance operation? Refresh is a maintenance operation. Fundamentally, DRAM chips should be doing it without the memory controller being involved. Why should the memory controller be involved in this, right? DRAM chips, if the DRAM manufacturer knows exactly uh, how to do this efficiently, it should be done transparently to the system. But today you cannot do it because the interface requires the memory controller to be the master, let's say. And the uh, DRAM cannot be autonomous. Row hammer protection could be another example of this. And memory scrubbing, scrubbing the memory to see which errors have happened and correcting those is another thing. So again, I don't want to go into all of these, but uh, this uh, self-managing DRAM enables efficient implementation of all of these. And also uh, eases uh, the development in DRAM uh, such that bigger steps can be taken because some of these changes are difficult to realize because you need to change the interface such that the memory controller can do it. And once you try to change the interface between the memory control and DRAM, a lot of politics comes into play. Because in industry, the way you make these changes happen is there's a standards body called JEDEC, uh, Joint Electron Devices, blah, blah, corporation, something. <laughs> but basically, they dictate the interface. There are hundreds of companies that are part of it. And all of these hundreds of companies somehow need to agree with some majority voting or, I don't know, plurality voting uh, to make a change. And getting those companies to agree on one thing is not easy, even if that thing is simple. Now imagine complicated changes like the interface changes that are big. It's very difficult, basically. But if you give some freedom to the or breathing room to DM, then it actually enables a lot of progress and innovation without requiring those changes, essentially. That was our idea. But of course, with any good idea, you get a lot of rejection. Those, this paper gets, reject, gets rejected, let's say, four or five times. But we don't give up on the idea, let's say. OK, we may talk about rejection later on. So if you're doing research and getting rejected, don't worry, you're not alone. Many Nobel Prize winners have gotten rejected multiple times. <laughs> yeah, including Einstein, actually. I have a favorite story about Einstein. So Einstein sent uh, a paper to a journal saying that, could you publish my paper? And this journal editor sent him a couple of reviews saying, look, we read your paper and do these changes. Einstein said, I didn't send you my paper to, to uh, get comments on it. I just said, publish it. So the, the, there are a lot of interesting things, I think, that are kind of uh, reducing innovation in uh, the way publications are handled today in systems. So, but Einstein's point is very well taken from my perspective, because uh, 
he knows what he's doing and he wants to publish it, let's say, right? <laughs> yeah, today reviewers actually reject ideas for almost no reason. For example, the Rohammer paper that we discussed that was published in 2014 could have been published in 2013, but it got rejected from the conference that we sent it to saying that this is not a real problem. That was the comment. I can show you the comments, but if you have time later. Uh, but keep in mind that uh, there is some process that goes on in every paper that you read, uh, that, you're, that you're going to read and that you're going to see in this. Uh, uh, and sometimes I may tell stories like this. Today, we don't have sometimes uh, stories for the Rohammer paper. Maybe later I'll discuss it. Uh, but good ideas get rejected. They don't necessarily get accepted right away, let's say. And it's not necessarily for good reasons. Usually, uh, sometimes it's very for very unfair reasons. For example, with the Rohammer paper, the comment we got was, this is not a real problem. The reason they thought this was not a real problem is because we did not show it in real applications. For, for them, this access pattern was not real, meaning a security, uh, like this sort of attack is not real for them. So you, this is calling security is not real in, a, in other words, right? So that doesn't sound like a very fair comment. Okay, uh, okay. so there's more going on in Rohammer, as you can see in uh, IEEE security and privacy, there are more works. They're actually very interesting papers. Some of these papers we covered this Cryptographic, cryptographic security and integrity against Rohammer recovered in last semester's uh, seminar course. Okay, so there's more to come. Now let me uh, conclude. Any questions, by the, by the way? No questions. Everything is good. Let me talk about some future a little bit. Uh, so future is getting much worse. Basically, DRM is becoming less reliable, more vulnerable. More issues may be appearing. Rohammer is becoming a bigger, perhaps. There could be other types of errors. And these errors could pose security vulnerabilities. And this is not just true for DM, it's true for flash memory and emerging technologies. But DM is very special today because its main memory is directly exposed to the programming language and the system. Right? Flash memory is a little bit farther away, right? There's a huge storage stack that you need to go through. So it's a bit harder to really uh, launch security attacks due to flash. Reliable issues, yes, no question. And then there are emerging technologies that are proposed to replace DM, but they all have their own problems. So this is from our paper from flash memory. You can see that there are many, many error types on the uh, Y over here, uh, program uh, erase cycling, programming errors, cell to cell interference, data retention, read disturbance, as you can see. And there are a bunch of mitigation mechanisms over here. If you're interested, you can, again, read this paper that I mentioned. And we need to build intelligent controllers for security, safety, reliability, and scale. And I believe actually intelligent controllers can enable this. That's what we're working towards right now. But more methodically at a high level, we really need methods for, I think this is a three-step methodology for understanding these issues and solving these issues. We need to really understand what's going on. That's why all of these studies that I mentioned are really important. How do we understand? What, what, what are we dealing with? Can we model it? Can we predict it? And we really need real device data and analysis for this and reliable metrics to really uh, conclude some things out of it. And that's what we've done in the Rohammer research implicitly. Uh, I've described a lot of it. And then the solutions need to be architected in a principled manner, in my opinion. There should be good partitioning of duties across the stack. You cannot give up performance and efficiency. There could be multiple solutions employed together, in my opinion. I don't think there's a single solution to Rohammer at this point. In my opinion, it needs to be multiple solutions employed together. Uh, but performance and efficiency are important. And I think going forward, patchability in the field is important also, because who knows what else are we going to see with technology scale. And design and test are very important, in my opinion, because uh, we need to design, automate the testing, and do online testing while the system is in the field. So one of the issues that are out in the open is what happens to Rohammer as the system ages, for example? You have a system that's out for 10 years. Is this still good? You have a system that's out in space. Is that still good? Right. What, what about these things, basically? I think that's why online testing and patchability are really important. So there are two major future Rohammer directions. One is understanding. As I say, aging is over there. There are many effects that are, still need to be rigorously examined. I will leave it at that. And solving. More flexible and efficient Rohammer solutions are necessary. Uh, and I believe co-architecting system and memory are, are, are is still important uh, because there's this divide between system and memory that's not very good uh, for overall system design today. Okay, that's what this paper argues for. If you're really interested in it, this paper has uh, essentially uh, surveys the work and uh, basically argues for two, these two major things. Okay, 
So we argue for that in other papers also. Uh, and this self-managing DRAM that I mentioned is really a way of better coordinating DRAM and controllers such that each of them can do what they're good at. Today, memory cannot do what it's good at because it doesn't have the freedom. Now let's give it the freedom that such that it can do what it's good at. And memory controller can be deal with what it's good at and what it's really supposed to be doing. Okay, understanding and modeling is done with the infrastructures as you can see. So we're getting close to the end. Any questions? A bit, yes, please. Um, You mean existing architectures that are out in the field? Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, as you can see, GI manufacturers put some solutions. Are they reliable enough or secure enough? That's a good question, right? <laughs> uh, that's why we're doing these studies. I think uh, if you really want to make something uh, completely uh, bulletproof, it's very difficult to do, I think, with the existing solutions that are employed in the field. That bar is very high, I think, today. You will need to, let's say, refresh like 10x more, 16x more. So you have to basically, basically take a huge performance and efficiency cut. I think basically you can do it, but it will come at a big, very large cost. You see what I mean? Yeah. So bulletproof security, bulletproof reliability is, it comes at a huge expense, unfortunately, because of the way the solutions are implemented. They're not perfect today. Yeah, but we're, 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 our goal is perfection because uh, uh, if, if, if you see these errors like once in a million, then you, they should be happening every day right? because of the uh, law of large numbers, right? Okay, that's a very good question. So let me go to uh, bridges over here. This was my favorite bridge, uh, but we have a lot of these bridge incidents. This is Seoul, Korea, this is uh, Minneapolis, this is Genoa. And more recently, this is close to another place that I used to live in. This is in Pittsburgh. They have some beautiful pictures, as you can see. It's not that beautiful if you're one of those people inside those things. <laughs> now, the good news is there was no fatality in this one. I cannot say that for the other ones. Uh, but basically, we've been building bridges forever. And clearly, we have not figured it out how to do it bulletproof yet. Right? That's an example. Some of these are actually due to aging issues. This one in Pittsburgh is actually due to aging issues. That and lack of maintenance, et cetera. Uh, but even though we've been building bridges for thousands of years, we didn't get it right. I don't think we're gonna get memory right. But the good thing is uh, with memory, we have this patchability. We have this controller or software that can actually protect against it. We just need to design the system such, such that it can patch it. Right? With bridges, unfortunately, you cannot patch those things. Or you can patch them at extreme costs, perhaps. Right? So it's good to think about this. So this goes back to basically what we have argued for for more than a decade now, uh, we really need to be taking a systems architecture perspective for this. So I should also mention that industry is writing papers about making in memory controls intelligent. This was a paper that was written by Samsung and Intel. They did not mention Rohammer in this. This was 2014. It was very sensitive, but they did mention some other DM process scaling issues. And they said, we should really be co-architecting memory and controllers. This is the only paper that they wrote together that I know of. These companies, they don't normally talk to each other unless there's an army of lawyers on either end. Uh, and then they, if you have an army of lawyers, uh, in the end, you're not talking to each other. Or even if you have one lawyer, let's say you're not talking to each other, let's say you're doing something else, let's say. Okay, uh, so let me give you final thoughts. I know we're a bit over time. You can go if you want, but there's actually something even more interesting here. So this is a slide from Satya. Uh, Satya is a distributed systems uh, expert at CMU. He was my former colleague. He actually, when, he, when, he, when I told him about Rohammer, he was very excited. He immediately incorporated into his course, distributed system course, as an example of Byzantine failures. Basically, Byzantine failures are characterized by undetected erroneous computation. It's opposite of fail fast, basically. If you have a failure, the best system is quickly fail with an error saying, I cannot proceed anymore, or give no results. Whereas Rohammer violates that, right? Uh, you get a bit flip and you don't know about it. And erroneous can be malicious. Intent is the only distinction, basically. It's very difficult to detect and confine these Byzantine failures. Do all you can to avoid them. This is, again, this slide. 
And again, Lamport uh, defined this Byzantine general problem. That's why it's called Byzantine failures. I'm not, I don't have time to go over it, but you can read this beautiful paper. So before Rohammer, there was actually some understanding of Memiers. This is a beautiful paper from 2003, as you can see. And this was also presented in the seminar in past incarnations. Uh, these folks said that, oh, we can induce memory errors in real machines, and we can actually take over the Java virtual machine. And they did it. The way they didn't induce errors was with this lamp. So they took this lamp, it's a heat source. They put it next to memory, and a bunch of bits flipped. And probabilistically, they were able to take over the Java virtual machine. They were able to get out of the sandbox as a user level program. So this is a beautiful paper. It's actually very interesting. I read it a lot before I started uh, doing research on Rohammer. But in a sense, not a lot of people took this seriously, right? Because if you think about the security community, who's going to launch this attack? You have to have physical access to the machine. And it's a very, very probabilistic attack because you get lots of errors in the system. You should, you're lucky basically if your system doesn't uh, collapse because of that. So basically, Rohammer is replacing that lamp with a much more precise mechanism in software. You can think of it that way. That lamp is gone, no physical access needed. In software, you can induce this error. As a result, a lot of people got interested, basically. That's why you see this action in the security community, uh, because they saw real chips are vulnerable in a simple and widespread manner, and this caused real security problems. And this reliability security connection is now mainstream. Even though we knew about this connection, there's no question about that, right? As that paper showed, now it's mainstream, right? because you could actually do this in real chips. So that's why you see a lot of road hammer attacks. I believe there's more to come. Let's see if we see in DDR5, as you asked the question. Uh, of course, the bar is higher, right? To attack real systems right now, because defenders are, are raised the bar also. So it's going to be more and more difficult to launch these attacks, but uh, it may be possible still. And there are many new road hammer solutions that are being proposed right now. Uh, Initially, people were not taking this so seriously, but I think uh, right now there's a lot of seriousness and there's a lot more solution papers that are being presented in both security and architecture venues. I believe there's more to come over here. And as I said, finally, the industry is actually publicly uh, writing papers about it, industry meaning major DM manufacturers. Okay, uh, I think there are also other uh, repercussions like uh, Rohammer enabled a shift of mindset in mainstream security researchers. Now people are thinking general purpose hardware has a lot of issues. Rohammer is one example that started, but what else is there, right? If you're a security researcher, that's actually a great thinking, in my opinion, great mindset. What else can I discover? And people who worked on Rohammer actually started working on other stuff in hardware. And two of the groups that discovered Meltdown and Spectre, these are actually uh, microarchitectural side channel attacks, heavily worked on Rohammer attacks before. So now there's a lot of literature on hardware security, actually. If you go to uh, these conferences, architecture, security, operating system, there's a lot of research on uh, hardware security in general. So there's more to come. And we're going to see some more hardware security papers uh, that are going to be presented in this seminar also. OK, so let me conclude with the slide. Uh, memory reliability is reducing. Reliability issues open up security vulnerabilities. And once these are open, they're very hard to defend against. Rohammer is a prime example of this. And I already said this. I think implications of Rohammer on system security research are tremendous and exciting, and they're still there. The bad news is Rohammer is getting worse. The good news is we, have, we know a lot about it, and we have a lot more to do. But I think we have a better mindset right now than where we were three years ago. Right? Three years ago, industry was saying, oh, we solved the problem, forget about it. Now, they're not saying that. Even when they write about solutions, they don't talk about Rohammer is solved. This is a solution that reduces the vulnerability. Okay, so we, but we are now fully aware hardware is easily fallible. We're developing both attacks and solutions, and hopefully we're developing more principled models, methodologies, and solutions. And if you're interested beyond the papers that we're going to cover, uh, one of them is going to cover uh, the revisiting Rohammer paper, and the other is going to cover coherence-induced Rohammer attacks, which is also quite interesting. So one of them is an analysis paper, and the other is a defense paper. No, attack paper. Uh, they have a defense also, actually, in that paper. So it's going to be interesting. And these papers actually give you an overview. This is a short paper that gives you the state of the art very quickly. Let me say, let me put it that way. It's only eight pages. Later. Okay. I think I'm going to stop here. Otherwise, I could keep going forever. <laughs> Any further questions? 